All right, so this is uh, the first uh, presentation I'll be giving on my Enfield study. So I, I did a research master's. Um, I did it part time, so I did it alongside when I did my PGA stuff. So I, this research is very much rooted actually within coaching. So what I thought I would do today, so this, uh, this functional variability, it's, it's like an aspect that developed kind of from what I was looking at in my, in my Enfield. So what I'm going to do to start with is kind of give you a brief overview on what I did in my end film and then actually what this, where it led. So, like I was saying, so I did my, I did my end film, I, uh, I defended my vibe at the end of last year, and I, uh, PJ professional, and uh, I, I do some social media stuff as well. So the, the end film, I actually looked, and it, it my, it was rooted in a question that came from my playing. So I found this really clever way to find loads of distance with my driver. So it's a, and I, I'll share it with you now, it's a little secret. So if you hit a wedge to 10 feet and then three putt, it really messes you up to the point you go to the next tee, you, you tend to break the tee when you put it into the ground. So you get another tee, but you get there and you just fire it. So, what can happen sometimes with golf driving is because we're looking at the ball from like a 2D perspective, sometimes we feel like the ball is going further than maybe it actually is. And I, I was starting to coach, and I had been coached, and it was kind of getting to the point, it's like, well, I, when I do my driving in a golf lesson, we talk about it as something that's very stable, whereas then when you go out on the course, there's obviously loads of different things going on. So, I used the constraint sled approach by Newell and started to actually look at like an overall system rather than just looking at driving as a single thing. Um, I looked at tennis serving. So if you think of a tennis serve, you've got a first and second serve. The actual task is exactly the same. Yellow ball, try and get it into a box, try and beat the other guy. But if you actually think about the actual difference in the how you perform a first serve compared to a second serve couldn't be more different. And it was looking at like to a second serve that the player doesn't necessarily go slower, he'll actually put top spin on. So the top spin allows you to clear the net a bit higher, it gives you a bit more depth. So they're really changing what they're doing because of the task constraint. So the task constraint on a first serve it doesn't really matter if you miss. If you actually look at like performance analysis with tennis serving, you could theoretically have a first serve percentage that's too high because you might not be taking enough risk. So if you've got that, and it's pretty black and white in tennis, but if you think about golf, you know, the, the situation changes. You know, you've got the performer yourself. So I, I kind of converted what uh, Newell did and uh, so put it into like physical attributes, psychological attributes. Uh, the environment changes far more than tennis does. And then the, the task itself, you know, we've got, we've got out of bounds, you know, the length width, all of these things change. So we can't go in and teach driving as it's this really controlled, very single actual thing, and it's not. So that, that got me interested in looking at three different things. So I had my performers hit 20 balls normally, 20 balls actually just trying to hit the ball further, and 20 balls actually trying to play for accuracy. Um, I did three studies within that. The first one was just track man, so not looking at the body at all, literally just looking at what the ball was doing. Um, I did a DLT study, so like direct linear transformation, so like I manually digitized like a single person. So I was trying to understand why that person was actually having some changes. Uh, that seemed great, so like from an ecological validity standpoint, like staying outside, actually being in their environment, especially with what I was kind of looking at, seemed to be the way forward. But the direct linear transformation has two issues. Um, very hard to actually get like six degrees of freedom, and it's a pain in the uh, bottom. So, so the last study I actually went back inside, used Vicon, uh, Kisler, so I used some force. I'm not talking about any of the force today, but you know, I, I did look at some force data. Some of the key findings, and when people try to hit the ball further, they tend to hit the ball further. 
when they tried to play for accuracy, they tended to lose this thing. Uh, in terms of their sequencing, so that's a finding from just the TrackMan study. From, from a sequencing perspective, I wasn't finding when they were trying to hit the ball further that there was any breakdown in the sequence. You know, I, I thought that might happen. You know, like if you, if you think about sprinting, do they try and stay loose. If they get tight, they tend to slow down. So I thought that might be something that would happen. When it comes to the accuracy, I didn't find the dispersion improved. And like you can see, one of the, the byproducts of trying to hit it straight, they actually hit it shorter. So if you look at uh, Brody's work, uh, he's saying like 20 yards, 0.75 shots per round. So trying to apply this accuracy thing, losing distance, not gaining dispersion, it's actually going to really hurt your score. I think when people are under pressure, that's sometimes a go-to. You know, well, I'll just try and keep it in play. You know, when we're looking at like speed accuracy trade-off theory, it was finding that um, if you're writing an email really quickly, you'll probably make some mistakes. So speed accuracy trade-off, do it quick, you put in some errors. When it comes to sport, it doesn't tend to apply that way. Um, I read a great study, quite an old one, very simple. They had a, a classroom split in half of just kids, and they were just aiming it across, just ball aiming it across on the wall, kept throwing it. Uh, half of them were told to throw it as hard as they could, half were told to try and make sure they hit the spot. After like six weeks, the kids that threw it hard, threw it harder than the guys that were trying to be accurate, and they increased their accuracy to the same level as the people that were trying to go accurate. The, the kids that were just trying to hit in the middle didn't really develop any speed. So that's a, quite an old study, but uh, I, I think it kind of puts the point of, and starts asking the question about speed accuracy trade-off, you know, and starts to go into like the psychological aspect. So you see what I've done here is, and this um, comes from some of the, the work that Ben did, is I was finding that some functional movement variability was letting the performer actually interact with the task. So, um, and I'll give you a great example. I, I was at Mizuno, and I was with their robot, just, wa just watching, and they're hitting shots, doing some testing. And they, they were testing, uh, I think it was 105 mile an hour clubhead speed, because if they do it too fast, the robot can't slow the club down. So it snaps the shaft. And they have, to, they have to tee the ball up in the heel because of the droop. The robot can't find the ball. So we get, look at the robot and we think, if only the robot had a bit of human about it. Whereas we can sometimes, as, uh, as uh, golf, golf instructors, we try and, well, we'll try and make people robots. And it's trying to find that balance. So, Looking at variability, is it good or is it bad? And again, this is, I, I, this is very simplified. But what, I, what I'm suggesting here is that novice has loads of variability, as in the rubbish. The elite player has loads of variability because they're fantastic. When, when has the elite player ever had an overhanging branch and gone, well, I'm going to have to take two clubs? Can't, can't deal with that. So it, it's looking at how we take the rubbishness, we try and take away the variability, so when you get into an intermediate golfer, they actually have less variability, but then when they go back out into the elite, it starts to spread out again. Um, looking at the freezing and unfreezing, the degrees of freedom. So actually, to perform well, the system might actually have more degrees of freedom to let them deal with the tasks that they might need to do, rather than actually going into this robotic thing that I gave you the example of. Um, I thought I would use uh, the A-swing as the example. So, uh, and this is no reflection on David, I work for David, David's a great guy. I just under I understand this one. Um, this would apply to uh, any, uh, any other model. So David used, used biomechanics, so he, he uses um, uh, a biomechanist, JJ Rivet, who, uh, who, who does a lot of stuff with the European Tour. So David really does try and validate his model. And do people know the A-swing? I'll give you a brief overview. So the A-swing, club out here, club across, short arm position. So he's, the model is basically trying to not have loads of degrees of freedom. 
hands travel less, club travels more, more shoulder rotation, try to work the body, you can create more with less. So if we're going back into here, perfect for this person. In David's book, and maybe this isn't uh, coaching biomechanics, maybe it's just marketing, but <laughs> the novice should use the A swing because they don't have to practice as much. So the, I think the A swing is a great example of a model that suffices the person here, maybe not so much with the elite. Always ask the question, I think this one comes up on a lot in coaching at the minute, is you see a tall pro, let's, let's use Bubba Watson as the example, won't do his swing, I don't want to get the feeling. And you go, well if he can do that, surely I can do that. Whereas because he's an elite performer, the variability probably lets him do bigger and wonderful things. You know, where, where do you find a way to transition? I don't know. You know, that's, uh, that's something that I would, I would like to look at. Again, this, what, this talk is about kind of my thinking of where I went with my research. This research certainly isn't complete. But so, does the novice, do you, you know, I don't know, do you train them, do you not? You know, if you know, speak up now. But uh, it just shows a, kind of a pathway. So this is kind of what we've gone into with this functional variability. So I, I'm looking at just pelvis rotation here, and I've just represented it in two very different ways. So this is just at a group level. So in my last study with Vicon, I, I had 10 people. So that is 10 people's pelvis rotation. This is the pelvis rotation of just one of those 10. What you're going to see here, and so red is the mean, black is the, uh, is the standard deviation, is they're kind of opposites. So if you, if you look in, uh, I should have put this in here, top of back swing is about here. So you'll see when we start coming into impact, it starts to spread out. So the pelvis rotation of the golfers is changing quite considerably. Um, if you look at Mike Adams' stuff, please don't get up in the because he's presenting. But uh, Mike talks about verticals, he talks about rotation. You know, lots of golfers, they've actually got a, a perfect place for them, but it's certainly not a generic position. You know, there's been a lot about the grip this morning. So that's going to change this a lot. Within the pelvis rotation of just a single person, what I was seeing is whereas in this one there seems to be more variability in the standard deviations here, compared to here, it's the opposite way around when you just look at someone on their own. So this uh, extra bit is, is actually, I, I don't feel like it's hurting. Um, when, when I uh, submitted my paper, uh, Sasha, one of his comments was well, how he kind of determined it. Um, across my three task constraints, I wasn't seeing this change. So when I had someone do their normal drive, when I had them try to hit it further, when I tried to have them hit it straighter, I wasn't seeing this change. So this was kind of inbuilt. So what I was saying is actually maybe that functional movement variability is actually allowing them to interact with the task. Maybe that, the performer and their skill level, because I've just done this with the lead, you know, I, ha I, haven't, I haven't tested higher handicaps. You know, that's something that I want to do uh, uh, next year or the, uh, in a couple months. So I, I think they've got very different findings if you do it with a novice, but I, I haven't done the testing. But what I'm saying is you've got functional variability letting it interact. And then with the environment, you've got shot selection variability. So but again, with driver, we kind of say, well, it's only one shot. Um, what I was finding, so in my first day with the track man, when, uh, when the players were trying to hit the ball further, they tended to launch it higher. When they were trying to hit it straighter, they tended to hit it lower. What it meant, and if I go back into here, key findings, 16 of the 17 participants significantly increased their ball velocity when they tried to hit it further. When it went into actual carry distance, it, it dropped a little bit. 
And what I was seeing is they were like very different flights. So some players were carrying it further, but then the total distance wasn't going as far. You know, the, what, I, what I was seeing, a big one with the accuracy drive, was the players seemed to be hitting it a lot lower, not carrying it as far. And because the dispersion hasn't improved, um, I use TrackMan, and TrackMan just kind of uses a USGA spec fairway to think of the role. So in theory, if they're not improving their dispersion, if they don't hit it straight, they won't get the roll from the rough. So it could actually be an even more dangerous strategy than I've even reported. But So again, and, and just to leave you with this one, is when it comes to the movements, and I, I could have done vector coding, and again, that's something that I would like to do, because I, I haven't talked about the interaction between the pelvis. So I've, I've just used the pelvis for this example. Um, if you look at the abstract, I actually put the pelvis in all three, um, so rotation, tilt, and bend. But I was, I, was seeing, I was seeing this phenomenon in both the pelvis and the thorax, but I wasn't seeing it in the, uh, in the velocity like this, in the sequencing. So it might be the two interacting that actually allows the system to stay stable. This is very new research. I, I, I don't have all the answers, but I, I hope today I've just kind of given you an insight into how I think. I, I kind of feel like I sit between a coach and a biomechanist. So i try and give you some ideas on how I think. I don't want you to go too deep into my head. We, the, the stuff I think about at work, and hopefully that just can give you a bit of an insight on kind of how you're applying yourself both from a coaching and biomechanical standpoint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um,